Thanks for joining me today. Well, Mary, a retired professional woman who had never been married, first came to see me in 1992 at about the age of 70. She had invested in three blue chip uh, companies in the 1950s, and she was savvy enough investor to know never to sell them. So uh, she held on to those three companies through the years. As a result, her three investments had grown to a value of about $1 million by the time she became my client. Mary, though, had a hunch that having all of her nest egg in three companies probably wasn't a really good idea. That's why she engaged my services. We worked together to slowly liquidate her concentrated hold holdings and diversify the proceeds into various asset classes. We set her spending at 4% of her portfolio, which was an amount intended to keep pace with inflation and uh, keep the portfolio growing as well. The strategy worked pretty well because over the years, her nest egg not only provided her a nice uh, income, but it grew to over $2.5 million. Over the years, we also created an estate plan for her to benefit several charities. With her financial needs taken care of and her legacy in place, Mary still had one real serious concern. Uh, she was pretty uneasy about who would make financial decisions for her uh, in the case of her being unable to. Uh, now Mary had no children. She didn't have any siblings, no nieces, no nephews. She had a uh, few close friends and that was it. So she appointed one of those friends as her uh, trustee in the event she became incapacitated. But several years later, the friend died. That time she asked me to be her executor successor trustee and her durable and health power of attorney. Now this meant I would make all of her financial and health decisions if she became physically or mentally incapacitated. I had always refused a request like this, but Mary, as she pointed out, had no one else. So after conferring with my compliance attorney, I agreed to act as her power of attorney and to serve as her co-executor successor trustee. I did this um, in conjunction with her uh, attorney, which um, was uh, a necessity to, to meet uh, SEC compliance regulations. Well, a couple years ago, I helped uh, Mary move into an assistant living center. I became increasingly concerned about her and noticing that she was becoming more and more forgetful and confused. At our quarterly review meeting a few months ago, Mary initially seemed pretty confused at that time. I was able to reassure her about the stability of her finances and she came, seemed clear by the time that uh, we finished and she left. Three weeks later though, I received a handwritten letter from her that said, you have my finances in a mess. I can't get to my money. You're fired. Now to say I was stunned would be a total understatement. Still, ethically, I was required to comply by moving her holdings to another broker of whom I had never heard of. Several conversations over the next few weeks confirmed to me that Mary was suffering from periodic memory loss and delusion. This gave me a, a lot of concern since in her mental state she could be taken advantage of really very easily. Yet, because she'd fired me and removed me as her power of attorney, I was powerless to step in and protect her from herself. Mary and I had never considered the need to protect her from a gradual physical and mental deterioration. Had she been disabled by a sudden accident or a stroke, I could have easily stepped in. Yet, because her decision to fire me was made at a time when she was arguably still competent, my hands were really tied. It was sad to watch Mary destroy, in a matter of days, the safety net that she and I had worked so carefully to construct over 15 years. Now, I wish I could end this particular webcast with some answers as to how you can protect yourself from slowly becoming disillusion disillusional and destroying your carefully laid financial plans. Unfortunately, I can't. This is one area where, as of today, I just don't have the answers. But perhaps someday I will. I certainly intend to.